You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from beautiful downtown Kansas City and also from Long Island, New York, where we are currently being joined by Dr. Luz Finasier. Uh, she's the head of the Allergy Training Program at Winthrop University Hospital, which is a campus of Stony Brook University School of Medicine. She's also a professor at SUNY Stony Brook. Um, and Dr. Finasier is a recent president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Um, she's wide, widely published and recognized as an expert in the field of dermatology. Uh, and we always appreciate uh, learning from you, Do Dr. Finasier. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, just uh, some brief correction is we are now part of NYU Long Island School of Medicine. So everything from Winthrop has now changed to NYU. So uh, again, thank you for inviting me. As I said, COLA is very special to me and talking to residents and fellows has always been uh, uh, one of my passion is education. So next slide. So what I plan to do is to identify patients with atopic dermatitis. It's important that you confirm your diagnosis. You determine the severity of the atopic dermatitis and then discuss current standards of care and discuss new and emerging treatment for atopic dermatitis. Next. So the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis is complex as, as you know, barrier defect is one of them. When you have the filaggrin defect, you have a, a, a barrier that is defective and allows antigen to go through. There is the itch scratch cycle and scratching obviously causes a barrier defect. The irritants, the allergens and the infections will then interface with your Langerhans cells and dendritic cells. Next slide. And then there is an immune activation, particularly of the Th2 and the Th22 signaling pathways. Next. Now, this releases cytokines, most importantly, are IL-413 and 5, for which we have target uh, biologics already. These uh, cytokines lead to IgE class switching and induce peripheral eosinophils and mast cells. Next slide. So you have the Th2 and Th22 cytokines, which also contribute to the impaired expression of barrier proteins and barrier impairment. Next. As I said, it's important to, not, to have a definite diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. There are essential and important criteria. Essential means it has to be there. It has to be itchy. There has to, ha there has to be an eczema. There has to be a lesion which could be acute, subacute, or chronic. There's certain morphologic criteria that needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, Age-specific in infants and children, usually the onset is infants and children, but you do have about 12% onset, adult onset. Face, neck, and extensor in children and any age group, you start to have your flexural lesions. You can spare the groin and the axilla and it's chronic or relapsing. First time onset of a rash that is itchy, it's not gonna make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. Other important criteria is early age of onset. As I said, most of them start in childhood. There is a history of A to P, either a personal or family history or an elevated total specific IgE and there's cirrhosis or dryness of the skin. Next. Contributing uh, associated criteria, these are non-specific, but it does support the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, are atypical vascular responses, such as your facial pallor, white dermographies, and you have your keratosis pilaris or your keratosis alba, which is hypopigmentation. Your palms are hyperlinear, and then you have atheosis. There's ocular or periorbital changes and other regional findings, such as around the mouth or peri or uh, auricular or, or in the nipple area. 
You can see perifollicular accentuation that is around here follicles. And in chronic stages, you have what you call chronic simplex chronicus. That's what you see in the middle slide. And like in simplex chronicus with prurigo nodularis, which you will see on the slide on the right, where there are nodules that are also thickened. Next slide. So what I wanted to emphasize is that it's uh, there are clinical features in dark skin that makes it harder to diagnose atopic dermatitis in skin of color than in white. So erythema in darker skin doesn't look red or pinkish. If you look at the left side, you will see the knee that's very erythematous, red and pinkish. If you look at the right side in the skin of color, you will see it's really more purplish. So it's easier to miss erythema. Also, uh, the scoring system that relies on erythema underestimates severity of atopic dermatitis. Your EC score uh, asks for, uh, for erythema, and I don't know how you will call the erythema on this darker skin on the right side. Interestingly, after adjusting for the erythema score, the black children have a six times higher risk of severe atopic dermatitis than their white counterparts. It just tells you how much you're going to miss if you're not looking for it. Next slide. So aside from that is, uh, is hypopigmentation. Uh, you look at the white skin, hypopigmentation is not very bothersome. The brown skin is a Filipino skin, and you can see here that you know, it, 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 it's still acceptable. But when you have hypopigmentation in a black skin, you can see how cosmetically disfiguring this can be. Next. There are certain uh, morphologic features in darker skin, such as follicular accentuation, which is typical of atopic dermatitis in skin of color. And they kind of look ashy. Uh, uh, ashy discoloration, as you can see on the right side. Next. There is profound cirrhosis or dryness and lichenification in uh, uh, dark skin, and there's a higher rate of lesions on the trunk. And this is a, a challenge in assessing the body surface area. You can see how you can call the around the shoulders as really not involved, but if you look at it, it really is involved. There's some ashy discoloration over there. Next. Parigo nodularis I discussed with you is uh, something you need to look for and you need to grade as part of the severity of atopic dermatitis in skin of color. Next. One thing important is monitoring topical corticosteroid side effects. So you see telangiectasias, 3A and atrophy, rather distinct in, uh, in white skin, but this is very hard to appreciate in dark skin. Next. Other social and ethnic differences between Black and Caucasian or white children in the United States, the Black children have a higher prevalence of atopic dermatitis. They have an increased persistence of childhood atopic dermatitis. They're usually more severe, and there's usually more quality of life impairments, such as impairment of sleep. In the Black and Hispanic with atopic dermatitis compared to Caucasian children, they have lower household income. They're more likely to be uninsured or underinsured. And interestingly, they do report that the, there is insufficient time for them to discuss their disease during the patient-physician encounter. Black children and adult children with atopic dermatitis are also less likely to have an ambulatory visit for atopic dermatitis and more likely to go to the emergency room or an urgent care visit or be hospitalized for atopic dermatitis. So the lower income and lack of private insurance do not account for all of the racial ethnic disparities observed in atopic dermatitis. Next. You want to exclude the diagnosis of other uh, diseases that can look like atopic dermatitis. So if you just want to click them one after the other, so scabies would be one. And, and, and you can see here the severe itching. You can have seborrheic dermatitis, where you have it in the glabellar area, nasolabial fold. The hands or the arms is a uh, classic irritant 
contact dermatitis from over aggressive wet wraps. This is ichthyosis where you can see the dryness of the skin. A cutaneous T cell lymphoma could very well look like atopic dermatitis. And this is an immune deficiency. This is a migratory polycyclic erythema and scaling uh, with peripheral uh, double margin, which we will discuss again later on. And finally, you have erythroderma or generalized redness or inflammation of the skin from other causes. Next. So let's look at this six-year-old girl, very pruritic eczematous dermatitis in the face, around the mouth, the arms, and the back. This uh, uh, parents report of diarrhea and failure to thrive after one up to one year of age. She does have peanut allergy, and both patients have atopic dermatitis. So you can look at the hair and look at the skin that this patient have. They she certainly looks like she has eczema. Next. However, as I said, look at the hair, and when you examine the hair, you can see here your classic bamboo-looking hair. Next. You have what you have uh, what you call Netherton syndrome. So this is rare autosomal recessive genodermatitis. You have erythroderma, which is the redness that you saw. You have the trichorhexis invaginata or the bamboo hair. Uh, sometimes it's easier to, to see this bamboo hair in the eyelash, but the scalp hair will give that to you as well. You have ichthyosis linearis circumflexa, atopic diathesis, and failure to thrive. Next. These patients may have immunologic abnormalities such as a transient neutrophil function defect, an impaired cellular and immune response, and race complement levels such as C3 and C4. Next. Let's look at another case. This is a patient who came in to me, a 61-year-old, five-year duration of pruritic eczema. She had no family history of ATP. She has since discontinued her only medication for hypertension. She had a trial of topical corticosteroids, and this did not help. Next. So this is at the patch stage of T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. So you have the patch stage, which could be atrophic or non-atrophic, and can go on for many years. You see patches of thin wrinkled quality, almost reticular pigmentation. Uh, the pruritus is minimal or absent, but some of them can have pruritus. It's common in the premycotic phase and may precede mycosis fungoides by years. It's often on the lower trunk and buttocks, but the body can also be involved. You also can have the plaque. Uh, next slide, please. And the tumor stage. Next slide. And so you have here different stages, which you can see in patients with mycosis fungoides. Next. Once you have the diagnosis, you want to determine the severity of atopic dermatitis because that will determine your treatment. So the extent of the disease, more than 10% body surface area is actually considered as moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. More than 30% is considered severe. The severity of lesions, if you see excoriations, lichenifications, and infections, it increases severity. And of course, areas that are highly visible or important for function, such as the neck, the genitals, the palms, and the soles, make you consider an increased severity for atopic dermatitis. Next. Finally, your symptom burden and quality of life, including pruritus, how itchy are they? Are they able to sleep? Is there emotional and mental health disturbances? They don't want to go to school or interference with daily activity. Next. So these are the tools, as I said, that you can use in clinical trials. You have the score rod, which is physician assessed. You will see in all three of the, these validated tools, uh, even the IJA is now validated. You have erythema as, uh, as one of the things that you will need to score. So there's a physician assessed symptom uh, uh, in each of these categories, but the score rod also has the body surface area, which is the extent of lesions. And it also includes the patient assessed symptoms, so patient sleep and pruritus. The easy score has the physician assessed, the extent of the lesion, but it does not include the patient's assessed symptoms. The IGA score is only a physician assessed, no extent of lesion, and 
um, and uh, does not include the patient assess symptoms as well. Next. Estimating the body surface area, we use the rules of nine, and that is uh, in adults and uh, different in children, but it is that the patient's own hand is about 1% of the body surface area. The palms alone is about 5, uh, 50%, it's about 5.5% of the total body surface area. Next. So the IGA, as I said, has recently been validated. Uh, it's the only validated IGA. It does not include the extent of the disease and quality of life, but it does, the validated one does give you more descriptions on what to look for. So you have the clear and then you have the almost clear where you have barely perceptible erythema in duration, uh, no oozing or crusting. Uh, in the mild, there's no oozing or crusting. When you start to have that, you go into the moderate. And then the severe would have marked in duration and lichenification and widespread. Next. The symptom burden and quality of life includes pruritus and sleep. So I ask them in a scale of 0 to 10. 0 where you have no itch. 6 distracts you from activities every day. 8 wakes you up at night. And 10 worse imaginable. Where are you in your pruritus? Uh, and the patient will give us a score every time they come in. So every time they come in, and it really literally takes less than 5 minutes. If you do the validated IgA, you do the body surface area, and you do the pariah score, then you have accounted for all the three uh, factors needed to determine severity of atopic dermatitis. Next. So once you've determined severity, then you're ready for your management strategy. Are you, am I back? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, great. All right. So uh, the management strategy is obviously um, if, uh, depends on the level of severity. Next, please. So I would like to go over the basic management of atopic dermatitis, which is uh, your skin care and uh, uh, identification of trigger and trigger avoidance. And this is usually why the patients are referred to the allergies is looking for triggers, including foods and contact allergens. Next. So what are the triggers? Infection, we know bacterial superinfection, eczema herpeticum, dermatophyte infection, and interestingly, look for malassezia simpondalis, which is common in the uh, uh, seborrheic areas, mostly in the head and neck. And it's been shown that in atopic dermatitis, IgE antibodies against malassezia simpondalis has been identified, and treatment of this uh, improves the atopic dermatitis in some patients. Look for contact allergens, such as irritant and allergic, especially because they're using so many creams and ointments, and they can be allergic to that, including the topical corticosteroids. Food allergies is less common, more in children than in adults, but if there's a clear exacerbation with food, maybe you can consider very limited testing for food, and aero allergens, such as the smite, pets, and pollen. Next. So the principles of therapy. General supportive, get the disease under control and keep it under control. Next. For general supportive therapy, hydrate that skin. You have a skin that doesn't produce moisture and does not trap moisture. So you need to supply the moisture with baths and then you need to trap that moisture with emollients. And you can use wet traps as well. You also need to identify irritants and allergens and avoid them. Next. Get your disease under control by the use of anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, the strength of your anti-inflammatory is based on the disease severity, the stronger steroids for shorter bursts of treatment. So it's not uncommon that my patient will have three different strengths of topical corticosteroids, the very uh, low potency, mid, and high potency. And finally, Keep it under control by steroid uh, sparing agents. There are uh, immunomodulators that you can use. 
as a proactive treatment and immune devices such as your atopicare uh, mimics and episerum. Next. Basic skincare, hydrate, soak for 10 to 20 minutes with or without oatmeal or baking soda, uh, quick clean with mild soaps and cleansers, Vaniderm, Dove Basis, Neutrogena, Aveeno, and Pat Dry. Then apply your emollients immediately on wet skin or top dried skin. This improves the skin barrier function. It reduces susceptibility to inherent irritants and strengthens the skin by delaying intercellular filaggrin and coiling. Just a word of 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 uh, race, of disparities here and diversities. Uh, uh, the uh, interesting anecdote where I told the parents to do this, bathing, hydrating, soaking in a bathtub. And after all of this whole process, the mom said, we do not have a bathtub. So it, it be conscious that there are different health healthcare disparities that you would have to address when you do this basic skincare. Even the prices of the emollients and the, and the medications that you prescribe the patient uh, may not be uh, affordable to the patient. Next. So the topical treatments, and I would uh, start uh, in, in the recent one year, there has been for approved new medications for atopic dermatitis. And I would discuss them as we go through this uh, talk. But the corticosteroids remain the first line of treatment. Unfortunately, it can cause skin atrophy and thinning. So you have these two big groups, your uh, the non-steroidal calcineurum inhibitor. You have the crolimus and primacrolimus. I like this, uh, uh, especially in the face, eyelid, very oral, genital, axillary because uh, they do not cause the side effects of topical corticosteroids. And then you have your PDE4 inhibitor, crisaborol, which inhibits the cyclic AMP levels, regulates pruritus. It seems to work for pruritus, and it's a favorable safety profile. Next. New kid on the block. Is there a JAK inhibitor or ruxolitinib? So this is a JAK inhibitor, and it blocks intracellular signaling pathway on which many pro-inflammatory cytokines elicit their pathophysiologic functions. They are approved for mild to moderate and not for severe atopic dermatitis. Next. So that was approved in September of 2021. It's not, for not adequately controlled with topical prescription therapies or when the therapies are not advisable. Uh, 12 years and over. Uh, topical short-term non-continuous and using combination with biologics, other JAK inhibitors or potent immunosuppressants is not recommended. Interesting words because I've been talking to dermatologists. I mean, these are the ones that you can do spot treatment if they're on biologic and still breaking through, right? So the wording is not recommended. It's not not contraindicated. It's not contraindicated. So uh, you, we will have to use our... Uh, decision process here. It comes in a 1.5% cream in 60 grams. Uh, it says do not use more than 60 grams a week and apply twice a day to affected area up to 20% of body surface area. So there are limitations there, but um, again, uh, uh, decision for the physician and the patient to make. The treatment uh, emergency adverse event is obviously a class box warning based on the oral JAK inhibitors packaging, and that would be your nasal pharyngitis, bronchitis, infections, eosinophils, uh, malignancy, uh, cardiovascular events, and thrombosis. That is all part of the block box in uh, ruxolitinib. Next, next. So, now you've tried the topical therapies and uh, you have a patient who's flaring, who comes to your office. So you have a acute crisis intervention. So how do you do this? Again, bleach bath or bath for 10 to 20 minutes once daily and twice daily apply your topical therapy. So at least a mid-potency topical corticosteroids on wet skin just the amount of topical corticosteroids that is the fingertip method, which is the amount of ointment in an adult fingertip applied 
to an area the size of two palms. So you can estimate how much the patient will need. The biggest problem is if you give a 15 gram tube in a patient with a generalized dermatitis, and you know it's uh, that 15 gram tube is probably just going to take care of the extremities. Emollient can be applied on top of the anti-inflammatory agent. Next. So this is how it's done. You've, uh, after you've soaked the patient and you've applied your anti-inflammatory, you soak one pair of one Caesar pajamas and gloves in warm water. You wring it out. You apply. You 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 put it on the baby, and then you put a second uh, layer of dry uh, one Cs over that, and the baby sleeps on that. Which good luck because um, you would have the baby crying the whole night, but at least if you get it in for four to six hours, it can be effective. The face is a challenge. Um, this is what they do in National Jewish. It's really very difficult to do at home. Next. When did you fail? So the def definition of failure is not standardized either. So this was proposed by an expert panel in 2017. It really has not changed. When you have inadequate clinical improvement or you have a lack of stable long-term improvement, you, you improve, but then you continue to flare. You have no relief from impairment. You're still itchy, there's pain, you still can't sleep, and there's still a poor quality of life. Or you start to have the unacceptable side effects uh, leading to treatment discontinuation. As I said, when, when you have your stria uh, and discoloration, then those are unacceptable adverse events. Next. There is also no time to treatment failure. So you can't say, oh, I tried it for two weeks and it failed. But given the range of potency and dosage forms, the recommended regimen is really maybe up to four weeks for active treatment of two to, and two to three times weekly at sites prone to recurrence for preventative treatment. So what I generally do is I do this, uh, I see the patient after another four weeks to just see where, where my treatment is going. Of course, in very selected uh, specific body sites, you may need more than four weeks of treatment to say that it failed. Next. Newer therapies, so let me just define the newer therapies that are out there. What are biologics and what are small molecules? So biologics are produced from living organisms. They're larger in size. They're typically parenteral or injected. The mechanisms by which they will interfere with pathologic pathways are either as soluble receptors, as antibodies against cytokines themselves, and antibodies against cytokine receptors. Small molecules, on the other hand, are compounds manufactured through chemical synthesis. They are smaller in size and given orally. Your aspirins and most of your oral medications are considered the small molecules. Next. So uh, the, you saw this earlier in terms of the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis. And in red are the two targets that we have approved already as biologics for atopic dermatitis. Next. So let me talk about that. Uh, you will see uh, we have experience for the polymab for many years now. It's a monoclonal antibody against IL-4 receptor alpha a component of IL-4 and IL-13, and it is approved for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis for six years and over, but I think now it's younger than that. Uh, and in atopic dermatitis, we see an increased signaling by uh, IL-4 and IL-13, and this is associated with the disease process. What does IL-4 and IL-13 do? Well, they weaken epidermal barrier function, they decrease antimicrobial proteins, and they decrease keratinocyte dis differentiation and epidermal lipids. There's an amplified signaling of TH2 in atopic dermatitis with increased, increased recruitment of the inflammatory cells. This then makes the patient increase uh, sensitivity to allergens and inappropriate IgE class switching. Next. So 
These are the two biologic agents that are approved, and I have them side by side. You have the pilimab and trilokinumab. Uh, we will soon probably have lebrocizumab, which is also an anti-IL-13. Uh, these are both for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, not adequately controlled by topicals. The pilimab, as I said, is even now six months and above, not six years. I'll change the earlier slide. And trilocinumab is 18 years and over. Uh, most common adverse effects of DUPI is uh, injection site reaction, conjunctivitis, blepharitis, oral herpes, and HSV. Very similar to Trela, they still also have conjunctivitis. It's more frequent with Trela than placebo, but it seemed less than uh, DUPI. Trello has conjunctivitis that seem to be less than dupi, but still over placebo. And you also have nasopharyngitis and eosinophilia. Difference in dosing, we know that dupi is 600 as an initial dose with 300 every two weeks. There are studies going on to extend this, but for now, they have 300 milligram syringes that will be given every two weeks. With Trello, you have 600 also as initial treatment, followed by 300 every two weeks. But it gives you the option for those who are less than 100 gigs, who are clear or almost clear after 16 weeks, you can consider 300 milligrams every four weeks. Another uh, uh, problem, uh, a problem that uh, some, especially children, may have with, uh, well, 18 and above, uh, may have is that they trailer comes in 150 milligram syringes, which means your initial injection will be four shots and your subsequent would be two shots. Next. For some people, this will not be important. Uh, Pruritus IL-31 uh, is uh, definitely uh, being looked at. We know that pruritus is both histamine dependent and histamine independent. Uh, IL-31 is believed to be critical in the development of itch in atopic dermatitis, and we are now on a uh, phase three trial of uh, nemolizumab for pruritus. There is a greater reduction of pruritus with anti-IL-31. So more about this coming up uh, in a few months. Next. JAK inhibitors, there are two that are FDA approved uh, just fairly recently. That's your abracitinib and the upadicitinib. Next. So the uh, next, these are JAK1 inhibitors. Both of them are JAK1. Abro or uh, from Pfizer is for more than 18 years of age, more than or equal to 18, where Yupa for by Avi is for 12 and over. Uh, the dosing is here and they are tablets. Uh, block box warning is the same for both. Uh, just to let you know, because that's a class block box warning for JAK inhibitors. Adverse events, very similar, nasopharyngitis, URI, acne, headaches, herpes simplex. Contraindication, a tad different between uh, Abro and Upadicinib, uh, where the antiplatelet therapy, except for low-dose aspirin during the first three months of treatment, is contraindicated with Abro. UPA did not have that in their package insert. For both of them, it is recommended you do baseline studies. It includes CBC, CMP, of course, for tuberculosis, hepatitis, and pregnancy. There are certainly drug-drug interaction with cytochrome P450 for both of them. And both of them uh, says no live vaccines. And to update prior vaccines, make sure you have them completely vaccinated, hopefully before you start your JAK inhibitors. Next. There are other available therapies, phototherapy or narrowband UBB uh, and systemic immunosuppressants. Uh, although not approved in the U.S. for atopic dermatitis, cyclosporin is approved in Europe for AD. Uh, and I think also urticaria. Uh, so they do show some efficacy in atopic dermatitis, but certainly limited by the risk of side effects. Next. Oh, let's look at the summary of the newly approved, of these uh, approved uh, therapies for atopic dermatitis. These are for systemic therapies. Uh, so look at the mechanism of action of 
there are two anti-IL-4 and anti-IL-13 and two jacks. Uh, the youngest age indication is for DUPI, which is now six months. And above, uh, the dosage is uh, 600 every uh, 600 as a loading for both of the IL-4, IL-13. Uh, with the TRELO allowing you to go to every uh, four weeks if uh, controlled. Uh, the, the differences in syringes between DUPI and TRELO. Between uh, the JAK inhibitors, uh, the, as I said, the uh, adverse reactions are very similar. Uh, the lab monitoring is for both. And uh, this, there's um, uh, the updating of prior uh, immunizations and no live vaccines for both of the um, JAK inhibitors. Next. So the traditional management of atopic dermatitis has really been reactive, only treating visible flares as they arise. So you're looking at this, they, your patients will go up and down uh, in time. They can have remissions and exacerbation. And one other thing you have to realize, it's not only the time factor, it's in an individual patient, you will have many different types of lesions from non-lesional to chronic lesion to subacute in a single patient. So uh, how do you address that? Next. So there is a proactive treatment, which I like to use uh, even in patients on biologics. And there are two studies that on one is on topical corticosteroids and the other is on tacrolimus on the use of proactive treatment. Uh, you, you use them two successive evenings a week. So in the European study, they did weekends, Saturday and Sunday, they would have them apply either the topical corticosteroids or the tacrolimus on areas that tend to flare, but look relatively uh, flare-free at the time that you apply them uh, uh, twice so twice weekly, and it has been shown that it has 3.5 times less likely to flare compared to emollient alone, and they really did not see adverse events in the proactive treatment. Next. Multiple factors combined to contribute skin barrier dysfunction. We talked about uh, very superficial about genetics. We can't do much about this, uh, but that is the uh, filagrin uh, 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 mutation. Then environmentals, we talked about triggers that you can identify and hopefully avoid. We talked about the immune activation of the TH2 and other immune cell types that will weaken the skin barrier and that these are targets of our current therapy. I would like to discuss some microbiomes, which are shifts in the microbiome that explains temporal changes in the disease activity. Next. So is the cutaneous microbiome a villain or a friend? We do know that atopic dermatitis flares have been associated with increase in staph aureus. The staph aureus produces exotoxins that stimulate immune responses. They worsen epidermal barrier by proteases and lipases. And that bleach bath reduces staph aureus and it increases expression of buyer proteins, probably uh, accounting for the efficacy and improvement in atopic dermatitis. Also in AD, aside from increasing staph, there is a reduction in microbial diversity. So both these factors, the reduction in microbial diversity and the increase in staph are focus of potential therapeutics. It's almost the same, uh, uh, I would parallel this with uh, the basis for fecal transplant in C. difficile. You need to improve to, to, to increase the microbial diversity. And the hygiene hypothesis is pro also probably predicated on this uh, diversity. Numerous studies have used topical commensal organisms to control the pathogenic growth uh, of staph, biofilm formation, or both. Next. So let me just show you uh, two studies. The first is a topical microbiome transplant of Rushamonas mucosa. This is the predominant gram-negative bacteria in the skin, and most healthy people are colonized with Rushamonas mucosa, whereas in people with eczema, only 20% uh, 
uh, have Rushimonas mucosa. So what they did is they uh, cultured the Rushimonas mucosa. They sprayed uh, the placebo sugar water and uh, Rushimonas mucosa twice a week. Uh, and they just allowed the patients to have normal skin regimen. And for six, after six weeks in adults and 16 weeks in children, they've shown 65% improvement of the skin. No complications or infections were noted. Next. Another interesting uh, study is the autologous bacterial therapy to treat staph aureus in patients with atopic dermatitis. So we know, again, atopic dermatitis is negatively affected by staph aureus, but the atopic dermatitis skin is deficient in the antimicrobial producing coagulase negative staph that can kill staph aureus. They, let's call this CONN SAM. So there's a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, clinical trials of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. That's called is the good staff. The, the good staff, which is the autologous conan SAM, is isolated from non-lesional skin. They cultured this and then they reapplied it in the forearms at 10 to the 7 colony forming units. And they received either the good staff or a vehicle. And what did they see? Staph aureus colonization in the lesional skin at the end of treatment with the good staph was reduced by 99.2% against the vehicle. This persisted for four days after treatment. And interestingly, the easy score at day 11 of those where the good staph was applied was significantly improved against vehicle. Really suggesting that bacterial therapy with autologous strain of skin commensal bacteria can safely decrease staph aureus colonization and improve disease activity, sever improve disease severity. Next. Prevention, I'm sure patients will ask you about prevention therapy, and I just included uh, the, the, the guidelines for this based on the most recent ones by the American Academy of Pediatrics. We have, uh, I'll discuss emollient therapy from birth, maternal avoidance, neonatal avoidance, breastfeeding, and stopping the atopic march. So the next slide. This is a randomized controlled trial of 124 neonates, high risk for atopic dermatitis. Uh, they just lathered these babies with full body emollient therapy daily, starting within three weeks of birth. Remember, these are high risk. They don't necessarily have any disease activity yet. And a protective effect was found on the cumulative incidence of atopic dermatitis. There's a relative risk reduction of 50%. And there was no adverse event noted uh, in, in these patients who were lathered. The conclusion is that emollient therapy from birth represents a feasible, definitely safe, and effective approach for atopic dermatitis prevention. It is also simple and low-cost intervention, and if it works, it could reduce the global burden of allergic disease. Next. What about uh, nutritional intervention uh, in the development of atopic disease? So way back, way back then, uh, there was no that we we thought that moms would go on a res uh, dietary restriction during pregnancy on lactation. They would not eat peanuts. They would not uh, eat eggs. But now we know that. Uh, the recommendations, the policy statement for the American Academy of Pediatrics is that there's no major role for maternal dietary restrictions during pregnancy or lactation. So if patients ask you, should I restrict my diet, your unequivocal answer is no. Uh, breastfeeding for at least four months prevents or delays atopic dermatitis with cow's milk allergy and wheezing in early childhood. There's only modest evidence that the onset of atopic dermatitis in infants of high risk and not exclusively breastfed for four to six months may be delayed or prevented by the use of hydrolyzed formula. And there's really no evidence that delaying introduction of complementary foods beyond four to six months prevents atopic disease. In fact, we can go a little further and say delaying the introduction of peanut uh, 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 is actually increasing the incidence of food allergies in high-risk children. Next. 
So where do we put in our uh, treatment uh, newer treatment regimen. So this is still from the yardstick that we published a few years ago. We will start, to, we are in the process of updating this yardstick based on the medications that have been approved uh, lately. So if you look at where ruxolitinib is, it says it has to be after failure of other topical agents. And so this is my guess. This is probably where we will put it in the yardstick. As I said, being updated, we don't have the consensus yet. But where will we put the JAK inhibitors? The, uh, well, let's let's talk about Trelo. Where will we put Trelo? Trelo Kinunab will probably be put about the same level as the Pilumab. Access of care is going to be important uh, in these patients. And the JAK inhibitors will probably be after the failures of, of these other uh, uh, biologics and before systemic immunosuppressant therapy. Will it be before cyclosporin or after cyclosporin? We don't know at this time. Uh, it appears safer than the uh, uh, other immunosuppressants that are out there. Next. So I discussed about emerging new therapies. Uh, they do have the potential to revolutionize atopic dermatitis care. Next. Actually, your biggest challenge is that if the will depend on the affordability and accessibility from a broad range of socioeconomic groups and with different insurance status. Thank you very much again for allowing me to participate in the COLA. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. I, I had one question, Dr. Foncier. Um, When do you pick um, or do you use the calcineurin inhibitors over crisabarol or are they kind of when do you go for one over the other? Or you mean the topicals? Okay. You're talking about the topicals? Yes, ma'am, yeah. But really, I mean, if you look at the yardstick, you can use either one over the other. Unfortunately, your calcineurin inhibitor still contains the black box warning. But but I really almost totally disregard that black box warning. There has been, uh, there, there has been uh, statements that say that that for tacrolimus and pimacrolimus, they really don't matter. So access of care is is very important so uh there seem to be more access because uh the chromos and pimacrolimus are now generic there's also a little bit more of eyelid uh burning uh in a, a crisabarol on the other hand crisabarol seem to work uh well for pruritus so uh Topical corticosteroids is my first line. However, in the face, uh, I would choose between the calcineurin inhibitors and crisabarol. And if this fails, then ruxolitinib uh, is my go-to drug. Is it, is it go-to over dupi now? Well, they, to do different indications. They, your your ruxol is still topical. Ruxolitinib oh, okay. is still gotcha. topical. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah. Gotcha. But you can certainly go from failure of your topical carcinoma and steroids and crisabarol straight to the, to, to the pilumab. Depends on the severity. If it's very severe, you have more than 20% of body surface area. You know your ruxolitinib will not work on them. I would say go start your dupi or your uh, trailo. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Dr. Fanishir, I'm one of the allergist immunologists here at Children's Mercy, Nikita Rajay. I had a quick question about, um, about the JAK inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, um, for the side effects, there are there is information about uh, some serious side effects, which are pretty rare. But when you are talking to the patients, how do you inform them about those, but not, you know, but have a balance yeah. because you don't want to discourage them from using them when yeah the balance them. is yeah the balance of uh yeah the, the, i i think there's a lot of fear for starting a jack inhibitor interestingly we have that fear of starting patients and jack inhibitors as well 
but I work in a rheumatology uh, practice where both of these JAK inhibitors are really being dispensed widely and patients accept that in rheumatology. So uh, for me, I you, remember you have, most of these patients have failed your first line, which is your dupi and your uh, trilocinumab plus your topical corticosteroids. So these are patients who are really more of the spectrum of severe and uh, the the incidence of these side effects are rare, but they're true. You will have to discuss that with the patient. Uh, we have the very the, the those that are over sixty. I kind of uh, hesitate to, because of cardiovascular events, but otherwise, I would do. I would explain it to them. I would do baseline labs just to make sure that they qualify, and then I would uh, say, "Let's give it a try." The other thing with uh, off-label use of the jacks is is using them for severe flares and then taking them out. So uh, not necessarily really long term in some patients. So you can um, uh, on and off use jack. Again, I said it, this is off-label. You can use jack that way and uh, probably have uh, monitor your side effects more closely. Uh, you cannot by um, by package insert combine your bio, your your jacks and biologics. It would have been interesting to just use jacks during flares. Sure, thank you. That helps. Any other questions? Or I think all is pretty quiet on our end. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fonzie. We appreciate it. Giving you back 10 minutes of your time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll see you at the college too. <laughs> we'll see you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.